any materials or anything that might be linked. So take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess on behalf of Drs. Alston, Vincent, and I would welcome you to this professional development. And um, really the keynote here is Dr. Alston. So um, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Antoine Alston. Uh, he is a native of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Um, he is the professor, or a professor and associate dean for academic studies at North Carolina A&T State University's College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. He's nationally recognized as a mentor, educator, and expert in the areas of diversity and inclusion. Uh, he received his bachelor's and master's of science degrees in ag and extension education from North Carolina A&T State University, and then a PhD in ag and extension education from Iowa State University. So he enjoyed a little bit of cold winter out there in Iowa, I think. Um, Dr. Olson has just won tons of awards, uh, including the honorary FFA, uh, American FFA degree, the uh, NACTA, uh, National Association of Ag Educators Outstanding Contribution to Ag Education, George Washington Carver's Distinguished Service Award from Iowa State, and uh, the NACTA Teacher Fellow Award. So he's also the first African American to ever receive the USDA Food and Agricultural Sciences Excellence in Teaching Award. Personally, I know Dr. Austin to be an avid hunter and a lover of barbecue food. And uh, we're excited to hear his uh, presentation today in professional development on the new farmers of America. Dr. Alston. Well, Dr. Palmer, thank you so much. I'd like to say, uh, colleagues, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you today. And I'd like to say, go Aggies and go Cyclones. Um, this, this, thank you so much for asking me to do this. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Vincent uh, for really spearheading this effort. The new farmers of America really uh, is something that is near and dear to my heart. My father, who was also my ag teacher, was my uh, was an NFA member. He was an NFA state officer, as a matter of fact, in North Carolina. And my grandfather, my mother's father, was an NFA member back in the 1930s. And I'm actually a third generation ag major. My uh, mother's father was a dairy science major at Delaware State. And he graduated in 1940 and then served under General Patton in World War II. And then, of course, my father graduated from 1867 and was my high school ag teacher. Then myself and now my oldest child is an animal science major at A&T. So we have four generations of 1890 ag majors. So we're very proud of that. So we're, we cover a lot of decades with ag in our family. So anyway, it's truly an honor and privilege to be with you today. Today's uh, presentation is entitled Gaining Perspective, Finding a Path to Pre Prepare Pre-Service Teachers on the History of the New Farmers of America. Do I get this presentation to advance here? The Declaration of Independence says that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the, their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, this is what the Declaration of Independence said, but if you look around that room in that portrait, you don't see too much diversity in that picture. And they say that all men are created equal, but really, were they created equal? The historical reality of our civil rights in our country is the, the historical reality of civil rights is that not all men are created equal. We know the, the ugly truth of our history, as great as our country is, we have had a long history of what I call uncivil rights, is what I would like to call it. You see, uh, we fought a civil war over this. We've been through civil rights history over this. We have had uh, you know, segregated schools. We have had, as recently as this year, Black Lives Matter, and then we had people trying to storm the Capitol, not trying to dead storm our Capitol just a few weeks ago. So as we can see, this in our country, race is something that, or racism is something that is truly still alive and well, unfortunately. But as educators, it's our job to really help alleviate this and to open people's eyes and to let them know that there's no place for racism in our society and that we all, as a, all of us are Americans, all of us are citizens of this global society, and it's up to us to live and work together in harmony to move mankind forward. So what has been the historical out to civil rights and ag education? Ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the New Farmers of America. Prelude to the NFA, 
1880, Booker T. Washington, who many of you know, established a agriculture teaching for Negro boys, a school teaching Negro boys about agriculture in a one-room schoolhouse in Tuskegee, Alabama, and what would eventually become Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University. This institute was built on the Hampton model of education because Booker T. was a graduate of the Hampton Institute, which is now known as Hampton University and Hampton, Virginia, which was really the first which was really the original 1890 land grant of Virginia before Virginia State was built. The 1890 land, uh, land grant act established formal collegiate training for Negro students interested in agriculture. And this provided really the first collegiate training. When Booker T established Tuskegee, Tuskegee was built more on a really a high school model, if you will, a normal school training to train teachers. But with the 1890 land grant, that really tried to approach the collegiate level of training. And the reason why you have to understand this is that this is 30 years after the original Land Grant Act of 1862. And with that act, one of the provisions of the 1862 Act said that we would not give um, funding to any state where race is a basis for a uh, provision for admission. However, we will provide funding to establish a separate but equal institution of higher education. Well, one of the things that they got right, they got the separate part right. We're still waiting on the equal part to happen, though. And if you look at 1890s across the southern United States and you look at their 1862 counterparts, it is night and day with the funding. And I'll get on that uh, in a second. The Plessy versus Ferguson doctrine, or uh, well, legislative case of 1896, 1897, established a separate equal doctrine that would really pro, uh, set the tone for how education would govern the Southeastern, or really the whole southern United States for really the next 60, 50 to 60 years. This uh, court case really dealt with public uh, uh, accommodations in public facilities, whether that was public transportation, public buildings. It mandated that there had to be a separate but equal facility for both majority and minority populations, or as that time they referred to as the Negro population. And I will use the term Negro as this is a historical presentation, and I want to use the terminology of the time frame. Prelude to the NFA. With the separate but equal doctrine in place, the plan for operation under the Smith Hughes Act of 1917, also known as the National Education Education Act, was put in place. It provided for both Negro departments and white departments of vocational agriculture. With this, when this act was signed, the Negro population of the South was barely 50 years removed from the slave economy of the South, and the, the migration north had barely begun. Now, what do I mean by the migration north? <clears throat> if you talk to most families, black and white, in the southern United States, we, a lot of us have our relatives in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, these areas. And there's a reason for that. Both black and white families tried to escape the harsh realities of the Southern economy, particularly uh, sharecropping. And sharecropping, or what some people call tenant farming, was really another form of slavery. And you know, if I may interject here, when I, I thought about this recently, I was born in 1975. My father went to college in 1963 and was the first one on his side to go. My, my grandparents share cropped up until 1970. So if you really think about it, I was only five, I, my family, I was only born five years after my family stopped sharecropping. That was in the 1970s. And really sharecropping, as I said, was a legalized form of slavery. And to put it in more perspective for you, you know anything about North Carolina, you know about Highway I-95, the interstate. Well, the land that I-95 runs through in my home county of Nash County, my family actually shut crop from the family who owned the land that I-95 runs on today. And we actually farmed the land that I-95 sits on. So just to put that in historical perspective for you. Three years prior to the passage of the Smith Hughes Act, they also put provisions in place for the Smith Lever Act. And, and with this act, they placed a Negro on the job as a federal agent for the promotion of this work. Now, I want to put, put this key point here. With the Smith Lever Act versus Smith Hughes Act, with Smith Lever Act, with the extension, they actually put a black person in charge of the extension work. But so was not the case with public school agriculture education. There was a difference. Prominent Negro leadership, which is primarily with your university teacher educators, expected a similar arrangement would be done with the Smith Hughes Act. But this was not the case. Disappointment existed when a Southern white man was appointed as the federal agent in charge of special groups, which at that time was Blacks, I'll say Hispanic here, but in the, the historical terminology it says Mexican, and Native Americans, as they said at the time, Indians. 
not an H.O. sergeant. He was a native of Russellville, Alabama, was appointed by the federal board as the first federal agent for vocational education for special groups. And I put that in quotations. Because of his unique personality, he was widely accepted by Negro agriculture educators. And under his leadership, many Negro teacher trainers received training to, to get their a graduate study to get their advanced degree through what they call the Julius Rosenwald Fellowships. And if you know anything about the history of vocational education, you've heard of Julius Rosenwald. Julius Rosenwald was a Jew, Jewish gentleman who was best friends with Sears and Roebuck. You might know those names. And one of the things that he understood uh, vividly was discrimination being Jewish. But one of the things he wanted to do, he, he recognized also that one of the stenches in the nostrils of America, uh, America was that how it treated its black population. Because he questioned, how can we call ourselves a land of free and home of the brave when you had a segment of your population that had was segregated, couldn't even go to school with the white population in their region? So he established what was called Rosenwald schools. And basically what these were, he went into the South and basically what he did was in these communities, the community had to put up half the money and Rosenwald would put up the other half. And that's how they established one room schoolhouses across many Southern communities. And that's uh, what they call Rosenwald schools. Just to give you a little bit of history, but that's how a lot of black uh, agriculture educators got their graduate degree. G.W. Owens, Dr. G.W. Owens was a teacher trainer for at Virginia State College, which is what you know now as Virginia State University. In 1927, H.O. Sargent encouraged him to write a constitution and bylaws for what was known as New Farmers of Virginia. Now, of course, as we also know, FFA's roots has its roots up in Virginia Tech and Blacksburg. So really, agriculture education has deep roots in the state of Virginia. In May of 1927, the New Farmers of Virginia held their first state meeting at Virginia State College in Petersburg, Virginia. And at the suggestion of Dr. H.O. Sargent, other states began to develop similar chapters with bylaws uh, using the New Farmers of Virginia as the foundation. The interface purpose is outlined in the handbook was to create a more interesting and intelligent choice of farming, encourage cooperative effort among students of vocational ag, develop rural leadership, encourage thrift. Or as my wife likes to say, I'll tell my wife I'm thrifty. She says I'm just cheap. Okay, we're thrifty, <laughs> you know, being economically sound. And you know that was important running a farm in the South. And to advance vocational education in the public Negro schools of America. The first section of the group was held at Virginia State College, and this involved the, the states of North Carolina, uh, Virginia, and later included Maryland, West Virginia, New Jersey. They had the Almont section, which was Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, and Oklahoma. And then they had the sergeant section, of course, named after uh, Dr. H.O. Sergeant, which was uh, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And they met this way from 1928 to 1935. And the one thing that I want to really, really bring to your attention is what's interesting about this, you know, most organizations, when they are developed, they start with the national organization, then you develop the, the, the regional and the local chapters. But NFA was the opposite. They started with their regional, then built up towards a national organization. Between the years of 1937-31, the idea of a national organization began to take shape between these states and between these chapters. At a meeting in Orangeburg uh, in the early 1930s, and if you don't know what's in Orangeburg, that's where South Carolina State is housed, which is our sister, 1890 land grant, and it's the sister land grant to Clemson University. Oh, I see Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts got, got to know. That's one of my good friends. Uh, this will give Dr. Roberts a shout out <laughs> down there at LSU, okay. the Tigers. But anyway, getting back to the point, though, uh, down in Orangeburg, South Carolina, they, they had a meeting to come together in a consensus of opinions of uh, they, they indicated that it was not only the right time, but it was highly feasible and desirable to establish a national organization for the New Farmers of America to bring all the black chapters together. So a committee was appointed uh, and led by S.B. Simmons. S.B. Simmons was the head Negro teacher trainer for agriculture education in North Carolina. And what many of us consider the godfather of black agriculture education nationally, he was charged with developing the pens, medals, and keys for uh, basically the paraphernalia for the NFA. So on August 4th through 7th, 1935, the first meeting was held at Tuskegee Institute. And for those of you who are not aware, Tuskegee is really, when you talk about black history, you really can't talk about black history without talking about Tuskegee. And one of the speakers at this meeting, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I did some research, was the man himself, my fraternity brother, Dr. George Washington Carver, because this was towards the latter part of his life 
But you know, he, he Booker T was at uh, Booker T brought uh, Carver to Tuskegee from Iowa State in the late 1890s. So just to give you a little bit of history and a little bit of time there. The founder of the NFA, the program at the first national convention emphasized preliminary sessions, a business session, elimination contest, oral talking contest, the work of committees. They had the first national judging contest, oral talking contest, and entertainment. And this is the order of the first conventions. Uh, the second one was held at Hamlin Institute, the third one at Prairie View AM in Texas, uh, Georgia State College, because Fort Valley didn't exist at that time. Bordentown, West Virginia, I mean, New, New Jersey, which was interesting because, and I've often wondered why this took place because New Jersey does not have an 1890. The furthest northern 1890 is Delaware State. So I always found it interesting as to why there was a chapter in New Jersey. And then what well, I had, excuse me, well, they held the convention in uh, New Jersey. And then the sixth one was held at Pine Bluff, Arkansas, uh, University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff, or as they used to call the Arkansas a and I. After 1940, all the other conventions until the demise, and I say the demise of the NFA took place in Atlanta, Georgia, at Municipal Auditorium. Now, this is a couple of important points I'm about to cover here. During the first six years of the national existence of the NFA, it operated outside of the, of the, US, office of the uh, U.S. Office of Education because at that time, as you probably know, the Department of Education didn't exist as a cabinet level uh, department until the early 80s between the Carter and the Reagan administrations. An arrangement was made for a quasi-experimental headquarters at North Carolina A&T. So A&T serves a headquarters during the NFA's existence, and we actually housed the NFA archives, which we're working on now with our project with National FFA to get some funding to help digitize the collection even more, because it's thousands of documents and, and pictures. The arrangement was, was made for this quasi-experimental headquarters, and S.B. Simmons, State Supervisor of Vocational Education in North Carolina, was made the Executive Secretary and Treasurer with Dr. H.O. Sargent serving as a roving consultant and journal advisor for the organization. J.R. Thomas, who worked at Virginia State as a teacher trainer, served as a national advisor. And he was the interesting thing. All communications between Simmons and Dr. H.O. Sargent were done primarily by mail given the driving distance. And of course, they didn't really have phones at that time. Too many universities had phones. And Simmons spearheaded the planning of each national convention filling in program details where he needed to. And all this was done by mail. Can you imagine planning a whole national convention by mail? Just think about that. We barely can do it today with technology, but they did it totally by mail. As far as what were the colors of the NFA, let's talk about the emblem. If you look at this emblem, this emblem looks mighty familiar. Any of you that are a diehard MFA should know this emblem right here and what it looks like. The plow represented the of the soil, the owl represented re uh, wisdom, the rising sun represented progress, the open bowl of cotton with two leaves attached uh, representing an important agricultural economic interest. And of course, the uh, cotton, of course, was the economic crop of the South. So just like corn was to MFA, cotton was to the NFA. The American Eagle with the shield and arrows representing the wide scope of the organization. And of course, the emblem of the NFA uh, included the letters of NFA and words of vocational agriculture. NFA chapters. These were the officers that you were required to have. The president, vice president, secretary, the treasurer, and you see which station each one represented, the reporter, and the advisor. Which, which, which officer don't you see there? All my teachers can't let me know this one. And I'll give you a hint. They guard the door. They stand by the door. The Sentinel. The Sentinel was the one officer that was not one of the, of the required officers for NFA. However, there were optional officers you could have. You could have the Watchman, which had a straight stick of native wood. I guess that was to keep the folks in line, OK? The, histor the historian kept a scrapbook. And we actually have some of his scrapbooks uh, in our NFA archives. The parliamentarian used Stewart's Help in Master and Parliamentary Procedure Book, the chaplain. And if you still go to a lot of the Southern chapters, there, some of the FFA chapters still have a chaplain. Because, you know, the South, you know, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, South Carolina, that's the Bible Belt, and Tennessee also. And then the song leader, and, you know, and one thing she said about the NFA was the quartet contest. And so the baton leader songs were very important to the NFA. Student officers. 
As far as the national office was concerned, there was the president, three vice presidents, one from each NFA region, the secretary, treasurer, and reporter. And as you see in this pre uh, picture here, this was uh, President Eisenhower meeting with the national officers uh, back during his administration, okay? So uh, the NFA officers did have some interaction with federal officials. The adult officers for the NFA consisted of the administrative advisor, the chief of the Ag Guest Service of the U.S. Office of Education, the advisor, three sectional advisors, one from each section, the administrative executive secretary designated by the staff of the chief of the Ag Ed Office of Education, the executive secretary, and the executive treasurer. One of the things I want to point out right here, and this is the board of trustees, and it says, which consists of the student officers, the administrative advisor, administrative executive secretary, and the executive secretary, executive secretary. One of the things I want to point out was the gentleman right here in the middle of this picture. This is Mr. Marvin Roundtree. Mr. Roundtree, that was my godfather and my ninth grade ag teacher. Mr. Roundtree was the 1957 national NFA president. The interesting thing about him was, was that the same year he was the national NFA president, his neighbor by the name of Jim Hunt was the state NFA president in North Carolina. Jim Hunt would go on to become the longest serving governor in the state of North Carolina and was an ag game major, just like Mr. Roundtree. So, Dr. Brooke, you probably already knew this, but yeah, yeah the Ag Ed Department of NC State produced a governor. So I just thought I'd just mention that while I was on this, but it was interesting. They grew up playing together, but they could not go to school together. But in one year, the Wilson County in North Carolina, which is right below Raleigh, produced a national president and a state president in the same year. Interesting. The Board of Trustees at the membership degrees, they had the farmhand, improved farmer, modern farmer, and superior farmer. The H.O. Sargent Award, any of you that know the history about FFA, remember back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, FFA had the H.O. Sargent Award at that time, which was the award uh, given, uh, dealing with diversity, uh, individuals who were champions for diversity. But the, the original H.O. Sargent Award really was given to the annually to the most successful farmer who had been out of school uh, no less than three years, not more than 10, and must have completed four years of what they call end-day unit, all-day young farmer instruction. One of the things that you gotta remember about agriculture educators, a lot of ag teachers, particularly in the South, did some, did they, in addition to their ag program during the day, they had to have, they had to have an adult program in the evening. I remember my father telling me when he first started teaching ag up until the 1980s, he had an adult program. He, he actually taught in the evening uh, to you know older farmers in the area. And really, ag teachers did a lot of the work of what community colleges do now. And it could, because our community college system in North Carolina didn't start until the 1960s. Uh, there was a star superior farmer given to an outstanding active member who reached the highest degree of proficiency. And, you know, and, and this involved what we now call supervised agriculture experience programs. They had the state level awards, a star modern farmer. You had a dairy farm award, farm mechanics. One that was interesting to me is farm electrification. Why would you have a farm electrification award? Well, think about the time. This was the time of the United States when rural America was just getting electricity. When my father was born, they were still using candles at the house. They didn't even have electricity when he was born in 1944. Uh, and was this not rural black families? It was rural white families too. You had poor black and poor white. Everybody was poor. They couldn't even afford the O and R. They were just Pope, P O, Pope. Okay, that's how it was for everybody. Okay, so so. But moving on, <clears throat> they also had the Farm Improvement Award, which was designated to stimulate activities for increasing the farm income and beautifying the farm home. And if you go through our NFA archives, you will find a lot of pictures of farm homes and barns, and they would do a lot of beautification work. Well, they used the NFA really as a mechanism to help and encourage farm and home improvement in rural south, southeastern United States. They had the soil and water management contest, or what well, oh, oh, well, we know, of course, is our land judging, you know, what some people still call today. Some of the NFA contest programs, public speaking, one I'll bring to your attention that you see in this picture right here is the quartet contest. And they sung Negro spirituals. Now, I can't begin to sing for you. I'm not going to mess your ears up. Now, a lot of y'all know one of my best friends in the world, like my brother, Dr. Dexter Wakefield. Dr. Wakefield can sing for you, but I don't have that baritone voice like Dexter. But uh, they, the quartet really was one of the main contests of the NFA. 
They also had the quiz competition, which established to which was established to stimulate a thorough knowledge of the NFA Constitution, NFA Guide, and parliamentary uh, practice. And then they had the talent competition. One of the things they had was the NFA Sweetheart competition. And my mother was an NFA Sweetheart. So I just thought I'd just mention that as well. Uh, in 19, but, but, so anyway, moving on to this right here, I'll, you see the title of this slide says legalizing the NFA. You know, as they always say, all good things must come to an end. In the early 1940s, uh, there began rumors out of Washington that the NFA would have to be legalized and be brought up under the office of the Ag, the Ag Education Branch of the U.S. Office of Education. Now, why was this in, uh, important? You know, as long as they operated outside the U.S. Office of Education, they had some autonomy to do what they wanted to do. But if they were they were afraid if they were brought up under the U.S. Office of Education's Ag Ed Branch, it would cut down that autonomy and it really would eliminate some of the control they had. And as the first bullet said, it said that first the NFA operated autonomously, having a national advisor and teacher trainer for one of the member states as executive secretary from a member state. Negro teacher trainers and supervisors were urged in the early 1940s to attend a meeting prior to the seventh national NFA convention uh, down in Atlanta. And actually the year before down in Tallahassee, Florida, at Florida and them, they actually had a meeting about this. At this meeting, it was made clear to them that they must vote for a transitional plan or else federal funds would be no longer available for subsidizing their travel and their expenses. So basically, think about yourself when you were growing up as a child. If your parents took your allowance from you, you would have been in, a, in a, some kind of way. You would have been hurt, right? Well, this is basically what they say is that we're going to, we, we control the purse strings. And if you don't come up under our control, we're going to take back that funding. So from this point forward, Negro control of the NFL, NFA was never the same. This is a very important point I want to bring to you. Over the next 25 years, repeated attempts were made to obtain a, an administrative position for a Negro within the ag -Ed branch of the U.S. Office of Education with no success being made. A.W. Tenney served as both the FFA Exec Executive Secretary and the Administrative NFA Executive, Secret Executive Secretary. Now let me put this in perspective for you. The National FFA and the, and the U.S. Office of Ag Education told gentlemen that held PhDs. Let me repeat that. Individuals that held masters and PhDs, they told them that you're not smart enough to run your national organization. And we're talking about people who in many cases had more education than the folks running the FFA were, and who had more education than the people of Washington. That just blows my mind. Let's talk about the merger, or as I like to call, the absorption. You know, the difference between a merger and absorption is this. If you merge, you still maintain some symptoms of both organizations. But you know, I often like to use this example. I usually give this presentation every year uh, at NC State um, to uh, Dr. Warner's class, his organization's class. And I remember one year, uh, I had a, one student ask me, well, what, why, why would you say merger versus absorption, Dr. Austin? I said, well, simple it is. I said, imagine that school down in Chapel Hill coming down here to tell you, you got to give up all that red and white and you got to put all this Carolina blue and white down here. The room, everybody looked at me, they were just shocked. I said, you see that look on your face? That's exactly how my folks felt back in the 60s when they had to merge their organization. It, don't, it doesn't feel good, does it? But that's the history of my people. Factors influence in the merger. If you were in public education, you cannot teach public education without knowing about Brown versus Board of Education. You remember in 1896, we talked about the Plessis versus Ferguson uh, legislative case establishing the doctrine of separate but equal that would rule education across the South. Where Brown versus Board of Education of 1954 established uh, was the court case that eliminated all that. And you see right here in the middle of this picture, Thurgood Marshall, who became the first African-American justice in the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Now, what was interesting about this, even though this happened in 1954, it was almost another 15 or 20 years before some states integrated. In my home state, in, in my home state of North Carolina, in my county, we did not integrate in Nash County until 1970, 71 school year. If y'all, if any of you look at the movie, remember the Titans with Denzel Washington, and you remember the, the history behind that, that was 1970, and that was up in Alexandria, Virginia. So I'm just giving you some of the time frame across the South about how this took place. 
The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is another thing that encourages merger. As you see, if President Johnson or Dr. King standing behind him signing this act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in particular Title IV, mandated that all public school entities had to merge. So guess what? You had white 4-H, you had black 4-H. Tell you something else, have y'all ever heard of New Homemakers of America? Well, New Homemakers of America was the black version of Future Homemakers of America, which you know now is FCCLA, which is the Family Consumer Science Organization. There was for every for every white version, there was a black version of the same organization. And in our NFA archives, we also have a lot of the black foliage archives as well. Implications of the merger. The NFA would give up his name, charter, constitution, bylaws, special prizes, awards, and signing, emblem, jacket, creed, flag, banner, colors, adult leadership, and consultation. What was left, ladies and gentlemen? If you take all that, there's nothing left. It was stripped down to the bare bone. And here's the interesting thing. If I actually showed you a picture of an NFA medal right now, you know the medals that you put on the jacket, on the back of it, it says FFA Foundation. So that, so let me repeat what I just said. The NFA medals were made through the FFA Foundation. How crazy is that? I couldn't go to school with you or, or be with you, but I got my emblems and all my stuff from that organization. The FFA would give up nothing, not even one board seat to an NFA member. And the national FFA membership would be increased by 13% in some southern states. And the membership would increase by as much as 25 to, excuse me, the national membership would increase by 13%, while the southern membership would increase by 25 to 30% in some states. Because you got to remember, the NFA at its height had over 50,000 members uh, nationally. And, and I'm pretty sure just like today, not, uh, not all students that were taking vocational ag were enrolled in NFA. So really, it could have been a lot more than that. Resolutions of the National Advisory Council to the National Board of Trustees of the New Farmers America uh, at the Joint Controller Meetings to discuss the merger of July 1965. So the adult officers of the NFA said before this merger happens, we want to put some resolutions in place that we want to see happen. Number one, the National FFA Constitution and Charter must be reconstituted to include representation of both groups included in the merger. Number two, the Secretary of the Health, Education, and Welfare Office, be it, which is where the forerunner to what you now call the, US, uh, the Department of Education, be petitioned to establish a permanent civil service position within 12 months after the merger for a Negro to be in charge. Well, of course, that did not happen. Resolution three, allow state association treasurers to get whatever release they may have available or allowable to local chapters to replace NFA paraphernalia with FFA paraphernalia. This is very important because you're asking, you're asking me to totally switch my organization from NFA to FFA. So I've got to have money to do that. And what you found is over time, a lot of the black and white schools end up merging. I can tell you like my home high school actually was the merger of two former white high schools and two former black high schools that came together to make the one high school. Resolution number four, given that the merge of the NFA and FFA is a wholesome product of the Civil Rights Act passed by the U.S. Congress in 1964, being required that the U.S. Department of Justice be asked to, for a legal review of resolutions one, two, it should actually be one, two, and three. Uh, they asked that this be done. Well, they presented these resolutions uh, before the FFA Board of Directors and, of course, and the Chief of the Ag Ed uh, Branch. And, of course, you can, you can tell it was met with a lot of hostility and a lot of pushback. And they emphasize the hazards of this to interbranch progress and solving the problems if these resolutions were even put in place. So to the demise of the NFA adult officers, none of this was taken seriously. So following the meeting, the two groups went their separate ways. Open lines communication were kept open. And they, they had the national convention in Kansas City. And they also, the, the, the NFA had their last convention in Atlanta, all went well. They had their last convention in August. And at the merger ceremony, there was evidence of congeniality between the organizations with both the NFA and the FFA Corps singing together. President Lyndon Johnson and Vice President Hubert Humphrey sent a telephonic address praising the merger of the organizations as upward bound of the great society. It should be noted that on November 30th, 1965, a month later, there appeared, oh, excuse me, in the minutes of the Governor Committee of the FFA on November 30th, 1965, a month after the convention, 
they, uh, there appeared, uh, there was a note that uh, came up asking about uh, the position for a Negro teacher trainer. Uh, excuse me, a Negro to be on the, the National FA Board of Directors and also in the Ag Ed uh, office in Washington. And of course, no action was ever taken on this. So it was not approved by the U.S. Office of Education officials. So thus, the request to have a black person in charge or a black person representative was eliminated. Conclusion. So what did the merger do to us today? In North Carolina, when my father started teaching ag in 1960, there was over 400 black ag teachers in the state. Today, there's around 30 some in the state of North Carolina, okay? You remember I told you there was about 50,000 uh, uh, African-Americans involved in that now, at that time. And keep in mind, that was the population at that time, so you gotta you know, keep in mind what, it was, what the population would look like now. Well, let's take a look at our teacher numbers. According to the National Association of Ag Educators, Nationally, there are six, uh, six to 700 uh, female teachers, around 6,300 male teachers. Then all together, you have about 13, a little over 13,000 ag teachers. Out of this, only 176 of them are African-American. Let, let, let me repeat that. Out of the whole United States of America, only 176 African-American ag teachers. Now, let me bring that down to the 1890s. If you're looking at active ag teacher programs, ag teacher ed programs in the 1890s, you got a North Carolina a &T, Tennessee State, Fort Valley, Virginia State's getting theirs back in line. Uh, Prairie View has one on the books, okay, keyword on the books. Southern doesn't have anything. Palm Bluff has some, but they don't, they're not active, okay. Uh, let's go, University of Maryland Eastern Shore has theirs on the books right now. So really, you're, you're really talking about, and Delaware State has got a concentration in it. So you're really only talking about really six, programs really produce teachers. And if you're talking about your really strong ones, you're talking about a &T, TSU, and Fort Valley are the ones that really are, are really actively producing teachers at some kind of noticeable level. So ladies and gentlemen, if you look at these numbers, the interface absorption today still has repercussions today for what's going on for the, these demographic numbers. If you look at this right here, that is a shame. 176 African-American ag teachers in the whole United States. That's ridiculous. And then if you look at Latino and Hispanic ag teachers, only 447. You look at the whole, you look at the state of Texas and California, you look at all that population right there, you know, particularly that, that, that region of the country. It should be a lot more. Let's talk about ag education for all. As you know, this is an initiative by FFA and Ag Ed uh, to make Ag Ed all inclusive for all. But the question I have is, is FFA and more importantly, is ag education ready to be ag -ed for all. I would make the argument to you, ladies and gentlemen, not only in ag -ed, but in agriculture at all. There are some people that are still trying to fight the civil war in agriculture because agriculture still has a lot of, a lot of stigma, stigma and a lot of connotation and ties to slavery in a lot of people's minds. And in some folks' minds, they still want to keep it that way. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to close with a closing thought by Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said that the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the true goal of education. Ladies and gentlemen, if, we, if the true goal of ag education is to promote agricultural leadership and promote agricultural literacy, my question is, is what are we doing to increase and promote inclusion and diversity in our profession? Thank you very much. We're going to answer any questions at this time. Antoine, while they're getting their thoughts together, I wanted to I want to add a couple of things that I appreciate you pointing out the statistics there at the end, because, you know, I, I we may have taught a little bit about the history of the NFA merger if we were a high school ag teacher. Yes. But I don't think that we take into consideration to make how big of an impact not only has it had on ag education, but how it has had an impact on the agriculture industry. Yes. And um, that right now in rural um, in rural America, especially in the South, there are still African American rural kids who um, who are not who don't have an opportunity for an African-American to, to teach them 
uh, or provide them these opportunities. And in some cases, they're, they, they don't feel comfortable in the school that they're at. I think one thing that was interesting, if you take at the same time of this, this event in 1965, and you take what happened in Brown versus Board of Ed, a lot of times we celebrate Brown versus Board of Ed, but the way that some of the Supreme Court justices wrote their reasoning for voting for Brown versus Board of Ed was devastating to the African-American community because they made it sound like the reason they were voting for it was because the African-American kids were not receiving a quality education and therefore they needed to go to the white school. And that opened up a hole for African American for schools to not hire the African Americans for those teaching positions, and and one great example is Blaine. I was talking to uh, Alvin Lark the other day, and Dr. Lark said, and if any of you that know Dr. Lark, or if you don't know Dr. Lark, just you know search him on the Journal of Ag Ed, and Dr. Lark said that during that when that all occurred, the white ag teacher at the high school, and he was the black ag teacher at the black high school. And when the schools merged, he would not be teaching ag today if the white ag teacher had said, I'm just gonna go farm full time. And that's the only reason why he got to keep his job and later become Dr. Lark. Um, and I think that we don't realize the devastating effect it has had on our, and I don't, you want to capitalize on that or not, Antoine, but I, I, I really appreciate you showing that because I don't think we grasp the longitudinal impact that it's had. Well, you know, to tell you here in North Carolina, I remember my dad was saying, and, th and this actually was up until 1980, when the Black Act teaching, the White Act teaching, uh, teach organizations merged in 1970 in North Carolina, the way they wrote the Constitution was that a black teacher had to be president one year, a white teacher the next year. They did that up until 1980. 1980. <laughs> they rotated presidents up until 1980. Give you another one. You know, talking about white and black teachers in the same county or the same school. My dad would say that when they first had the state, the summer conference, the teachers conference, dad and his white counterparts, they would ride to the, the teacher conference at NC State, for example, when it was NC State. The black ag teachers would meet on one side of the hall and the white ag teachers would meet on the other side of the hall. Now we, we rolled up there together, but we had to meet separately. <laughs> so, you know, it was just so interesting, you know, just to, to hear that history, you know. And I remember a couple years ago, the state FFA camp, this was back in 2010, they dedicate what they call SB Simmons Way, which is now the front road when you drive into the North Carolina FFA camp. My dad and my godfathers, who were his roommates at AT, they, they said to the group, they say, you know, when we, when we were your age, it would have been illegal for you and I to be in the same room together. That was just mind boggling. <laughs> you know, just mind boggling. You know, so much history. So much. So let's see, is there any questions in the chat? Um, Oh, okay, I so see Dr. Robert said LSU and Southern just signed up to the Asian so that Southern school. Oh, good. That's good. So they see that that's good, that partnership. So in case y'all haven't looked in the chat, Dr. Roberts was saying LSU and Southern have established articulation where those students who want to be able to take AA classes can and meet those requirements. That's good. And you know, actually, I can tell y'all this again. This show, Doug, some of y'all know Doug Laverne. Doug is actually, I think I can safely say this. I think Doug is actually the last ag, uh, ag ed teacher. Southern produced. I think I can safely say that. And Doug, Doug's probably his what mid thirties, you know, early thirties, you know. So that just lets you know how few of, uh, you know, if you look nationally, if you look at most of the African Americans that have PhDs in ag year right now, and I'm not saying this to brag, but more, a lot of them came out of North Carolina A&T, you know. And I'm not saying that to brag, but that's just the truth of the matter right now, you know. Yeah, the, the hope is to get enough interest so that they can, you know, get some of their programs back. They have a, you know, a program on the books, but it hasn't been active in a really long time. So hopefully, if we can get some more interest going, they can maybe get a faculty member back. They could focus on that and offer their own courses. But uh, to do that, there has to be the interest there. So that's kind of the, the goal with the articulation agreement is to get them in a place to where maybe they could get that back. 
And you know, my frat brother, Dr. Orlando McMeans, who's the dean there uh, of Ag and Southern, I know that's something that he would definitely push. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm glad of that, definitely. So are there any questions from anyone? Dr. Alston, I have a question. Um, I like uh, Stacy said, I appreciate you bringing up those statistics at the end because I don't, we, we talk about it at AAAE and, and everywhere else all the time of recruiting, um, bringing in diversity as it's, as if, as if it's this thing that's, that wasn't, ha hasn't happened before when really, really we didn't have an issue with diversity and African-Americans in ag, that was a huge part of the population and then it wasn't. So how, um, how do we bring that? Have you, what, what programs at like the high school level or like at, you know, now FFA level, have you seen to, to kind of reintroduce it as a viable path? Cause it, you know, there's so many studies out there when you ask a kid to point to who, who, who's a farmer, they point to the white man, you know, who's in agriculture. They, that's, that's the association. So have you seen any programs that work or that seem to be that you, that you like that are working in like the high school type level? I'll be honest with you. I don't know if you've seen, and I'm not trying to promote Dr. Roberts and our study, but Dr. Roberts and myself and Dr. English, we did a study that's in the Journal of Research and Technical Careers, uh, research out of UNLV. Uh, it was published back uh, last year, and it created a national model looking at agricultural student recruitment. And here's what that model said. For majority of students, as far as we look at different uh, factors, but as far as people fact, what does factors in general? Uh, extension agents, veterinarians, greenhouse operators, farmers, it might be a wildlife officer or whoever. They actually have somebody they knew, right? There was some, some kind of agricultural or natural resource related job. African Americans were like, that was, I mean, these were cited as factors that encouraged them to major in uh, some kind of area of ag, just not ag, but just agriculture in general to go to college, right? If you look at African Americans, FFA and 4 H have been bubbled up into the top team. It was uh, in the office of that, it was actually television programs, internet resources. Uh, so any of y'all watch like Dr. Pole, for example, the, the veterinarian. You know, I'm just using that as an example because actually that's one of the things my daughter loves. She loves Dr. Pope. You know, uh, she's having science information now, but, but my point is, is that I'm not saying uh, African Americans are not an FFA and FFA. They are. I mean, I'm sorry, FFA. Not, I mean, they are an FFA, but not on a large scale. So I, I would say to you that there's probably a pockets of teachers, and I emphasize pockets, you know, where you got folks that are really having inclusive programs that are really doing it. But let me say this about international FFA, and I don't hold back when I say this. FFA, and they, were, and they were doing this, they were doing this up until recently. I can count on FFA, and the keyword count on, when FFA needed to have a diversity picture, I could count on one hand, I knew exactly the teachers they were going to pull in what state. Uh, you know, uh, down in Manning, South Carolina, Mr. Haynes. Mr. Haynes, then y'all know Deshaun Bland, and Deshaun just, uh, was a national officer about, what, back in 2016, 17? Well, Mr. Haynes was his ag teacher. He he, he graduated in ag business from AMT, uh, Deshaun did. But Mr. Haynes was a Fort Valley graduate. But my point is, is that they would grab people like from Mr. Haynes' uh, place, or they would go to Chicago High School Ag Science. They, they would go to what I call the, you know, the programs they knew they could gra grab somebody and get a get a, get a photo op and, and use that to represent everybody in the country. Well, if I could multiply Mr. Haynes, or Chicago High School Ag, or Saul's High School, or some other ag teachers I know, it would be great. But I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know of any programs that are really working, per se. It's not really so much program, show. It's more of the individual person and what they decide to do. If you got somebody willing to reach across the aisle and be inclusive and include kids, that's what it really comes down to at the end of the day. Uh, it comes down to the individual person and their heart. Because, you know, because here's the thing. You could be a minority teacher and discriminate against majority students. You know, the racism does, does, is just not a white thing. Or black thing. I mean, it, it goes both ways. Even in even in African-American community, you might have light skin versus dark skin. I mean, all these isms. I mean, it's just across the board. I mean, you find that in, 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 in all sectors of society. Thank you, Dr. Allison. Anyone else have any questions? The floor is still open. Dr. Allison, I want to ask a question and you don't have to answer it, okay? Well, you know I will. <laughs> so I know you met with some of the FFA leadership, but I haven't heard beyond what you've said about working with the archives and I, th that's valuable to preserve history, but I'm, I'm curious what the discussion was like going forward. So we, uh, I'm glad, so uh, I met with Mark Peschel, who, is, uh, who was the CEO of FFA at that time, 
Uh, we had a great discussion with him and uh, um, oh, when, uh, with in, in the National Teach Ad campaign. Um, Ellen Thompson. Ellen, yeah, Ellen Thompson. Yeah, Ellen. We met with Ellen and Mark. Um, we met with them. And then since Mark has stepped down, uh, Dr. Wood, of course, y'all probably know Dr. Wood, you know, who's the chair of the board, the National Bay National Board of Directors. He's going to be coming to meet with me on March the 3rd, as a matter of fact. And Josh is going to be coming. But so Josh was at least joining us by Zoom anyway. But um, we, so we have still active discussions, okay? Uh, we have got proposals before them. Our, our ag librarian, who actually used to work at the National Library of Congress, we've got a proposal before them to actually uh, to commemorate these archives, you know? So, and but not only the archives. We actually want them to put money into curriculum. Because it's got to go beyond the archives. It's got to be curriculum, you know. And I've got to brag on Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts really is one of the ones that really put that idea. But, you know, about, we have, we have talked about more, but, you know, one thing is he really brought to my attention when he was, you know, was about curriculum. Him and my colleague, Dr. Ennis, some of y'all know Chastity. We really had those discussions about, you know, it's got to go beyond the artifacts. It's got to be ingrained and interwoven. It's got to be a thread in our everyday program, you know. And so uh, that's where we're at right now. I will tell you, and I'll say it, I will say it publicly, Dr. Wakefield and I, and Dexter's the one who did his dissertation on the NFA, he interviewed my dad and a lot of others. You know, we, we, we have had our time for FFA, where FFA in the past would say they would want to do something and it didn't happen. But I will, I will brag on, some of y'all might remember Erica Flores. Erica used to be with National FFA. Erica uh, did a national commemoration back in 2010. We commemorated the 75th anniversary of the NFA. And uh, actually at that time, let me see if I can find it. Um, they, we had these coins, these commemorative coins. I don't know if y'all can see that on the camera, but on one side, well, on one side is the FA emblem, and on the other side is the NFA. And they actually gave these to us as commemorative coins uh, back in 2010. They did a big celebration, but that was the only year they've ever done anything. But on, but on a lasting scale, I'm hoping that this time that things are going to be serious, you know. And I would just say this. I'll say this publicly. It's a shame it took somebody getting a foot on their neck out of, out in the Midwest. You know, uh, y'all know the George Floyd. I'm talking about George Floyd. It's a shame it took that to get people all of a sudden serious about DNI. And I and I'll tell you what's so interesting about that, uh, Travis. I know this goes beyond what you asked, but it relates back. I'm getting calls from so many companies now that want to give money to A and T. You know, I'll put it this way: one of my good friends, one of my dear friends, Ebony Weber, who's the national CEO for Man of Me. Y'all know Man. Ebony said something that interesting on the other day. I was on the advisory call. I'm on the National Advisory Board. She said, you know, up until last year, Manners, we had always been chasing the money. Now the money is chasing us. When she was saying it, I was like, whoa. But then she's right because that's exactly what's happening at AT. Money is chasing us, <laughs> you know? And I said, yeah, bring the money, but I just look at what it, what it took to get to that point. But let me just put this, and I'm going to sum it up by saying this. You remember I was talking about separate but equal? Do you know that 1890s, just like 1862 land grants, we're supposed to get a dollar for dollar match for our research and extension dollar? Do you know we didn't get our match until last year, and it still is not a permanent part of the budget like NC State is? So like if you go, and I'm not saying the culture, I'm just giving this as an example. If you go down to LSU where Dr. Roberts is and look at LSU versus Southern, if I go to Florida and m versus Florida, UGA versus Fort Valley, VSU versus Virginia Tech, UK versus K-State, uh, not Kansas State, but Kentucky State. <laughs> I was trying to make sure when I say K-State, I'll verify which one I'm talking about. My point is, we still have several but equal today. Why do I have to beg for what I'm supposed to have by law in 2021? Think about that. That's crazy. <laughs> that is absolutely crazy. But the federal government has allowed states to get away with that, that foolishness, you know? And it's still a part of what I call that Jim Crow mentality. And y'all know about Jim Crow, which is really what Plessy versus Ferguson really led to. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anybody? Antoine, I brought up that point to a legislator in Kentucky once. And, and one of his comments was in regards to the fact that, can, you know, our 1890 was struggling to keep the books uh, afloat. And I said, well, you would too if you weren't getting any of the federal money. Um, exactly, exactly. Amazing exactly. how that works. 
And look, and I will tell you this, I don't care what institution you go to. All institutions, one time or another, have some crazy person leadership. <laughs> you know, every institution has struggled with some kind of leader at some point in time. You know, and I, I'll put it to you this way, just to put the reality of resources. I was talking to our sports uh, trainer the other day. You know, we at a t we got one person, we got two sports trainers and one equipment manager. Our colleagues down the road over at Chapel Hill, they've got over 20 just for football. <laughs> Just for football, we got some, we got one, we had two for all of our sports, but yet we still compete. <laughs> you know, it's just how we have to do it, <laughs> you know. And, and you know, it's interesting. You go down there where Dr. Roberts is down there at LSU. LSU and Southern have always just intrigued me that you got two schools in the same town, but yet with vast different resources. I mean, you really want to see several but equal. Go to go to a place where you're in the same, where both of your land grants are in the same town. <laughs> that'll really blow your mind you know <laughs> yeah that's interesting it's a it's a point that uh you know i talk about i teach history and philosophy to grad students and a lot of them have never thought about those those aspects of just the differences in campuses because you know uh southern universities in north baton rouge and then we're uh, kind of south baton rouge here uh, at lsu and so it's a pretty big difference and then also you know most of them have we're taught just kind of the merger happened in 1965 and that's pretty much it. That's the end of the story. And so it's kind of an eye opening experiences for a lot of them to, to just hear uh, all the backstory about it. So I, I love how you're talking about the curriculum piece, because I think that's desperately needed for high school students to help them understand uh, NFA at a much deeper level. And I will say, is this emerges, uh, Dr. Vince and Dr. Robert, Dr. Park, uh, uh, all of y'all on here, you know, I would just like to, I said, Dr. Osborne, oh man, got living legs on, on the call, Dr. Osborne. <laughs> you know, I would just say that it, we will definitely like to bring y'all in on this. I see Dr. Warner up here. Uh, we definitely need y'all, you know, your voice, you know, to help us put this together, you know, and how this, how this evolves. I see Dr. Linda up here. So, yeah, um, I thought I saw Dr. Lambert up here. I thought I saw Mr. here a minute ago. But anyway, um, yeah, we, we just, just uh, thank y'all for this opportunity uh, today. Thank y'all again for being here. Um, I appreciate it. I, I have said before, um, just a reminder, if you want to, to rewatch anything, we will have this posted at some point. I'm not promising any dates. <clears throat> right, Dr. Rutherford. Um, we will have this posted behind the firewall on the Southern Conference website. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for being here. And this is our last PD session. I'll see you all at main conference next week. Thank y'all so much. I got to get on this presentation for Kansas State now. <laughs>